veterans in Ohio. This case took place in the year 2017, and it is the case of Reagan Tokes. Alright, so let's start with some background on Reagan. She was born on March 13, 1995 in Edgewood, Kentucky to Toby and Lisa Tokes. She had one younger sister. She was raised in Maumee, Ohio and was an honor student and graduate of Anthony Wayne High School. While in high school, she was on the varsity tennis team, as well as the lacrosse team. She loved animals, she loved nature, she loved spending time with her friends and family. She had a Christian upbringing, which led her to want to help those who were less fortunate. Was said that she was a vibrant young woman who had a passion for life and an amazing smile that lit up every room. After she graduated from high school, she went on to attend the Ohio State University, which was always her dream. And at that time, her parents and sister
Crip. 
Phillips gang during his youth. Now, in November of 2010, he abducted a pregnant woman who was eight months pregnant, and she had her two-year-old son with her. She was just about to get her child out of the car when he came up behind her and put a knife to her throat. He also threatened the child's life. Now he essayed this woman right in front of her child and then he forced her to drive him to several ATMs to withdraw money. Then he forced her to drive him to her home where he essayed her again and then stole her DVD player. This victim was afraid to testify because she feared for her life and the life of her child if she did so. So they made a plea deal with Goldsby because they feared that, you know, they might not get a conviction at all. So they made a plea deal. He was able to plead down to robbery and attempted RAPE. And that was in May of 2011. He was sentenced to six years for each charge to be served concurrently. And he also got credit for time served while he was awaiting sentencing. So he was released in November of 2016, just three months before Reagan's murder. When he was released, he was given a GPS ankle monitor by a program for ex-offenders called Alvis, but they didn't monitor him in real time, meaning they would only look back to see where he'd been, you know, but they did not watch where he was in the present moment. And they wouldn't take him in any of their housing programs because he was too violent of an offender. But there was a program that took him into their halfway house and it was called Exit. Ex-Offenders in Transition. So they gave him temporary housing. But they didn't monitor him at all. They only required that he be there between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. But I suppose they figured he had an ankle monitor, so somebody else was in charge of monitoring him. They said he had a pass to leave the house during what he claimed were his work hours. And his parole officer didn't monitor him either. What is going on, right? He violated parole several times and committed six robberies without being sent to jail in the three months that he'd been out. Just three months. The parole violations, which included letting the battery on his GPS bracelet die, as well as spending several nights away from the exit program's housing center were considered 
situations to realize that he was the one who did these things. I don't know though. I'm just saying it doesn't make sense to me. So that's my guess. Otherwise, I can't imagine how, you know, the authorities knew that he had done all these things and he just kept walking around, you know? So I I'm not clear if you know, if you're able to find out, let me know. So anyway, after his third violation, a hearing was scheduled for February 23rd, which would have resulted in him being sent back to prison. So now, going back to the crime that we are here to talk about, investigators used his GPS information and they tried to figure out what seemed to have gone on that night. So, they could see that Golsby spent the evening roaming Columbus, Ohio, looking for a victim. Like, they were actually able to take the locations of his monitor and then go there and look at security footage from the various, you know, businesses at the location and find him. You know, they were able to find him in cameras all through the night, everywhere he went. So, as I said, he was roaming Columbus looking for a victim. He walked around Ohio State University's campus and North High Street. He got on a bus and traveled downtown. He then spent an hour walking around in circles near Bodega, you know, the place where Reagan worked. And after Reagan left work at 9.45, she ran into Goldsby, who forced her into her car at gunpoint and abducted her. He made her drive him to two ATMs to withdraw money, but she wasn't able to get any money out, I think because he asked her to put in a number that was more than what she had in the accounts, you know? So, they stopped at the first ATM at Chase Bank at 10.02 and tried to withdraw $500. Twelve minutes later at 10.14, they went to another bank, the Huntington Bank. At 10.18, Reagan and Goldsby arrived in an alley where they stayed for 12 minutes. And that is where, obviously, he essayed her. He made her drive back to the first ATM and forced her to withdraw $66.00. Next, they stopped at two gas stations, a Sunoco at 11.12 and a Turkey Hill at 11.41. After that, he made her drive to the Seattle Grove Metro Park. And he had her park the car, take off all her clothing, including her shoes. Remember, it was February, it was freezing. He marched her into a field and shot her twice in the head. One was to the back of her head, and the other through the left side of her face at close range, execution style. And it was felt that he had decided what he had done to her earlier in the night. After the murder, he took her car to his girlfriend's house. They went to McDonald's at 1.45 a.m. And it could be seen from small burns in the car and the existence of the gas can that he tried to set Reagan's car. 
officers pretended that they believed him. But meanwhile, while he was in jail, he confessed to two of his friends that came to visit that he was the one who murdered Reagan. And they didn't keep that to themselves, luckily. Anyway, during his interrogation, he also said that Reagan had begged for her life, telling him, quote, all I want to do is live. And they believed that she probably thought that he was ultimately going to let her go if she did everything that he said. It was later found out that Colesby had gunpowder residue on his clothing that he wore that night, and Reagan's Kate Spade purse was found at his girlfriend's house. He had given it to her as a gift that night, already emptied out. He also told them where the gun was, even though he said it wasn't his gun, he didn't use it, but he told them where to find it. And they found Reagan's DNA on the gun, because clearly it had been put to her head directly. So the trial finally began on March 5th of 2018, so about a year after it happened. And the jury was presented with a huge amount of evidence. And the jury heard from the witnesses, the two friends that he had confessed to, and the girlfriend who had received the Kate Spade purse as a gift. The jury was also told about the mysterious TJ who nobody was ever able to find, although the police did truly go out and try to find a TJ, even knowing there wasn't one, but they looked. And then a psychologist took the stand and told the jury about the sad and difficult childhood that Goldsby had, so they should know what he had been through and what had brought him to be the way he was. They were hoping to, you know, make the people feel badly, make the jury feel badly for him, and at the very least, you know, give him some leniency, even if they believed that he was guilty, you know. But the prosecutor argued that other people who had similar backgrounds didn't do what Colesby did. He said, quote, those other people don't commit robberies, R-A-P-E-S, kidnapping and shoot poor young girls in the head, end quote. So, during the closing arguments, the prosecutors argued that Colesby murdered Reagan to avoid being caught. The defense attorney said something that just made my mouth fall open when I heard it. I've never heard such a thing. She got up there and she said, there is no TJ. She said, Colesby is TJ. Like we knew that, but she was telling us that now. Okay. So what now? You just said he did it. What? Then she goes on to say that her client is not smart enough to have planned this murder. No, he just panicked and killed her, but it was not planned. She knew that the case was lost, but she was also hoping for some leniency. So she said, how could he be smart enough to figure this out? He's not even smart enough not to commit a crime while wearing an ankle monitor, she said, in her own words. Like, he's going around with an ankle monitor, doing all these things. He's obviously not very smart. He's not smart enough to have planned this. That is what she said. So, on March 13th, which would have been Reagan's 23rd birthday, he was found guilty on nine counts, including multiple counts of aggravated murder, aggravated robbery, kidnapping, and R-A-P-E, and tampering with evidence. 
sentencing, he said the following to the jury. Today, I would like to apologize to the Tokes family for the crimes I committed against your daughter. When I first got locked up, I lied about everything. I said there was a TJ. There is no TJ. TJ is not real. I made TJ up because I was trying to wiggle my way out of the crime. The only other thing I have to say is, um, please have mercy on me. That's all I've got to say. So, when it came time to determine the penalty, the choice was either the death sentence or life in prison. And the jury couldn't agree. Four of them voted for life in prison and eight voted for death. So he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Now here's the thing. The judge said one of the most meaningful things I've ever heard a judge say. Like usually the judges have some long poetic thing that they, it seems like they wrote it out, you know, in advance and they probably did, but here is what the judge said so spot on. Quote, Reagan did nothing wrong whatsoever, and yet she forfeited her life because of your background. You get spared because of your background, and yet she forfeited her life, end quote. So after he was sentenced to life, in prison, he pled guilty to six robberies that he had done before he had murdered Reagan. And he is incarcerated at the Ohio State Penitentiary, a supermax prison. Reagan would have graduated in May of 2017, and she was awarded a posthumous degree. Now here's another shocker. sense of it. And my heart goes out to her family. 
prison. But yet, out he goes, you know? It's like, clearly, he was not a person that society needed unleashed on them. You know what I'm saying? He was a danger to others on the street. So much so that one of the halfway houses wouldn't take him. Like, if there's any halfway house who will not take you, then you need to be still in jail. Am I right? If a halfway house says he's too dangerous, we can't take him. How is he out? Okay, first qu that's the first question. And then, you know you have this violent man out on the streets. You gave him an ankle monitor for a reason. Now use it. It's like nobody cared. It's just like, let's, you know, set him up so it looks like we're doing all the right things. But in truth, he's a free man. He's 100% free. And look at all the things he did while he was out for such a short time. This guy was completely out of control. Like, I've heard of, you know, a few things falling through the cracks, right? We all have. But all these things that he did come on, and they're just like, oh, well, you know, he hasn't done enough things yet to require immediate uh, action. We'll just give him a court date. And we'll deal with it then. But what do you do with people like this? I mean, what, you know, prior to him getting out of prison, there was no law in place to keep him there for any longer. He was only able to get a six-year sentence because he was able to plea down, you know, and we, we know what happened there. And we can't blame that victim, really, for not wanting to testify. I would be afraid to also, if you think about it. I mean, that guy was super scary, super violent. He had been in a gang. He was a repeat offender for all kinds of things. What if she had testified and he had not been found guilty? Or what if he had, you know, gotten out a few years later and came back to hurt her? Like, I understand her, but, you know, like, I understand where she's coming from entirely. But knowing what we know about his childhood record, having already been a offender, so to speak, as a juvenile, having done what he did to five and six-year-old children, doesn't that tell us something about what his future holds and what can be done? I mean, this is the question, really. What do you do to protect society from people like this? So the next thing I want to talk about is the jury. The fact that they were not able to all decide on the death penalty. I mean, I try to imagine being on that jury, and it is very difficult to think that you personally are in charge of deciding a person's fate, whether they will live or die. Imagine holding that in your hands. So I understand there were a few people, I think four people, who didn't want the death penalty. Or maybe they had some religious reasons, you know, there could have been all kinds of reasons why they didn't vote for the death penalty. But then I wonder if the judge had been allowed to say to them, what he said in court. I wonder if that would have changed the minds of those four people. You know, the fact that he was being given mercy because of his background, but that Reagan had to die because of his background. Why is that fair? You know, it's like, we're gonna let you live because you had a rough background, but yet he gave Reagan no mercy. Like, he asked for mercy 
see, buddy. 